All right, I think it's time to get started. I think the numbers have kind of stabilized. So welcome everyone to the next seminar in the um, Melbourne Climate Futures slash Climate and Energy College uh, seminar series, supported by the Strategic Partnership for Implementation of the Paris Agreement, SPIPA, um, supported by various donors in Europe, particularly the uh, European Union and parts of the German government, uh, and working with the, uh, uh, the, the uh, German International Ministry. Um, I'm Peter Rayner, I'm the academic lead for the Climate and Energy College, and it's a delight today to continue our kind of survey of the various aspects of the climate and energy transition, this time starting to think about some of the financial aspects and perhaps one that's drawn a little less attention than most. Uh, so the, the topic is, is um, beyond disclosure, managing sovereign climate risk. And it's, it's given uh, by Arjuna Dibley and Zoe Witten. Um, and this is kind of thinking about a different aspect of the climate finance problem. We've obviously heard a lot about how corporate risk um, might figure in the way climate will impact investment decisions uh, and their consequences. But this is thinking about perhaps a, um, an issue around sovereign debt. And um, Arj and Zoe are very well placed to deliver this. They're currently both working at Pollination at the moment. Um, and they have backgrounds around climate finance and law. Arj uh, has originally a background in law and then uh, has taken further degrees in climate economics and law, has worked at Stanford and, um, and at Oxford. Uh, Zoe likewise is an executive director at Pollination, uh, has um, degrees around the areas of climate finance uh, and various investment advice and thinking about the, uh, the kind of nature of in environment sustainability and governance uh, in, the, in the climate risk space. Um, and uh, has been working kind of in this area for quite some time. And the two of them, I think, have been thinking quite hard about this perhaps less traveled aspect of the whole climate finance uh, and climate risk area. So I think Arj is gonna start uh, talking about the general background and then hand on to Zoe, I think roughly halfway through. As usual, we'll ask you to put questions in the Q&A. Um, at the end, we'll probably, I'll, I'll cut to Angela, who's uh, running the, uh, the meeting and get you to unmute and ask your questions directly, unless you don't want to do that, in which case Angela can read them out for you. So at that point, I'll be delighted to hand on to Arj. And I will mute Thank myself. you, Peter. I will uh, just give me one second and I'll share my slides. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Peter, for the uh, generous introduction. And, um, uh, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, I know it's been a very um, exciting time for those of you who've been following the COP in the last couple of weeks and attending the COP. Um, and, um, um, you know, hopefully we can, uh, we can meet that same level of excitement with our presentation. Um, so, we are, uh, as, as Peter mentioned, um, we are uh, presenting on a topic that sits at the, at the nexus between climate change and sovereign debt. And um, as Peter mentioned, um, um, you know, for, for some of you who are, are new to the sovereign debt world, um, which, you know, it's a, it's a fancy term which basically refers to government borrowing. Um, and, and for those who are, are new to this world, you, you know, may be surprised to hear that the nexus between sovereign, sovereign debt and climate change is actually uh, a very active one, um, uh, both in, in the research world and in the practice world. Um, and, you know, scholars work on various dimensions of, of this issue, such as, you know, how climate change impacts public lending to governments, um, the, the climate, very important climate justice implications of, of sovereign debt, uh, and so on. Um, so we, we wanted to, to start the presentation by acknowledging um, that there are, um, there are many others who do very good work in this area um, and encourage you um, if, if you are new to this area, to, to, to look at some of that work, um, but also to, um, to just highlight that, you know, we're, we're focusing on this, um, the highlighted uh, area of, of the way in which private investors uh, um, 
um, invest in, 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 government, um, in, in government debt and, um, and how climate change has, a, has an impact on that. So this is a, a short overview of what we'll cover today. Um, um, we'll, we'll start by talking a little bit about sort of def defining terms and explaining why sovereign risk and climate change matters. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to make the case that um, even though this might be a slightly more neglected area, uh, it's, it's a very important and interesting one. Um, we will we'll also then cover um, how private investors have been responding um, to growing understandings of sovereign climate risk. Um, as you know, in general, when faced with, with, with risks of any sort or climate risks in particular, uh, investors usually have one of two broad choices. Um, they can either divest from their assets, walk away from them, um, or they can um, engage um, their investees to try and work with them and, and reduce the risks um, that they face. Um, and so to date, investors have been pursuing divestment strategies uh, mostly. Um, so in, in, in this third part, we put forward um, a framework for how investors might engage with, um, with sovereigns. Um, we, we then talk about some of the unique challenges with, with an engagement strategy. Um, and in conclusion, we, we set out an approach to sovereign engagement, which we think navigates some of these um, unique challenges. Um, and as we said to, to Peter, when we agreed to do this talk, um, this is you know, uh, very much an early stage kind of er, early stage thinking for us. So we you know, would very much welcome your, your comments and, and feedback and input at the end. So um, let's start with a few basic definitions. Um, we, we don't want to labor this point because, you know, I know many in the audience will be very um, uh, across these concepts already, um, but we want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and, and so this slide basically sets out um, the basic structure of the sovereign debt market. Um, when we're talking about sovereign debt, um, we're really talking about governments or, or government institutions taking loans um, from investors. Um, and governments pay back those loans plus plus the interest on them uh, to investors through um, through economic activity that occurs within this within the jurisdiction of that government. Um, and this is where climate change and its potential economic in impacts become an issue. Um, obviously, if climate change um, negatively impacts the economy, it, it puts strain on those debt repayments. Um, so these loans are transacted through a legal instrument, usually a, a bond or, or a note, um, uh, which includes you know, terms of the loan. Uh, it details the length, the tenor of, of the bond, um, and usually it details the risks of, of an investor lending to a government, um, as well as a myriad of other terms. Um, the, the other element that you'll see on this slide is, is credit ratings agencies. Um, these are relatively independent bodies which, um, which are separate to uh, investors and they um, independently evaluate national governments um, and, and subnationals um, and give them a credit rating, um, such as a, you know, a AAA rating uh, to help investors understand how risky an investment is. Um, or more importantly, how likely the government will um, be able to pay its debt. So when we're talking about sovereign risk in this presentation, we are really referring to the risk that the government will default or, or fail to pay back a loan it gets from investors um, under this type of arrangement. Um, now, I'm sorry, sorry if that definition was somewhat basic, but I thought we should, we should start there. Um, uh, so, the, um, I guess there's, there has been significant attention recently um, uh, and significant amounts of work um, looking at the way that climate change may impact uh, the sovereign debt market and the way uh, that uh, it may currently be priced into um, sovereign debt um, or underpriced. 
um, in, 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 this, um, in this lending. Uh, so, you know, uh, recent work has looked historically um, uh, at uh, the fact that climate change uh, risks might already be pr being priced into sovereign debt. So recent work by Bob Burr and Uli Volz has suggested um, that for developing countries, they are already paying a significant premium for um, being exposed to climate, uh, climate risk. Um, however, you know, looking into the future, uh, climate risks will will obviously continue to impact many governments as as um, as as climate change um, continues to intensify, uh, and and the reason for this is because the physical risks obviously that will will affect countries like hurricanes and droughts, um, uh, and that will have flow on effects for um, uh, for um, GDP growth. Um, but also because of the economic transitions, which uh, will will also impact country economies. So um, this slide is, is basically aimed to give you a sense of, of why that might be the case. Um, the figures here highlight the expected um, changes in fossil fuel consumption uh, based on IEA's um, net zero emission scenario, uh, which was released earlier this year. Uh, and this projects um, uh, fossil fuel demand um, uh, th through to 2050. Uh, and what we can take away from this is really that country economies which rely very heavily on fossil fuel exports uh, are likely to face significant change to the current drivers of economic growth. Um, and ultimately that could impact their ability to service debts if those uh, transitions are, are disorderly. So there is a lot of research in this area. Um, uh, and and um, and on the next slide, um, we we try to summarize um, some of the work that explains the transition, the the, the transmission pathways. So the the pathway between uh, climate change, um, its physical manifestations or its economic manifestations. Um, and the way that flows through um, to economic impacts, which in turn might affect the ability of a, of a government to repay its debt. Um, so for, for example, you know, I obviously gave that example of, of a transition pathway of, of heavily dependent fossil fuel countries. Another example might be uh, drawing from this slide, you know, there's been considerable research done um, over many years by Marshall Burke and colleagues um, uh, that, that shows, for instance, that temperature increase can have an, um, an aggregate impact on, on country um, productivity, which, you know, at an aggregate level may lead to a reduction in GDP, uh, particularly over longer time horizons. Um, and what's important, I guess, to note about these transmission channels is that they can also feed back on themselves. So, for example, a significant weather event could um, expose large scale losses um, in households that, that are uninsured, for example, which could in turn create financial system instability. Uh, so there are feedback loops in this um, economic system uh, as, there are with, um, as there are with physical climate systems. So the effect of, of, of this research um, that's been carried out um, uh, and, a, and a suite of new tools has been that capital markets and key actors in capital markets are starting to understand the importance of sovereign climate risk and are taking steps to start accounting for those, um, um, uh, which is affecting investment decisions. Um, so this slide really summarizes um, some of the steps that have been taken amongst uh, credit ratings agencies, which um, uh, as I mentioned before, um, are the independent bodies which evaluate governments for their for their risk level, um, uh, and you know we're highlighting on this slide um, some significant um, um, uh, tools that that these agencies have invested in to to try and help them better understand the climate risk exposures of, of governments, um, um, as well as some emerging research um, from the Bennett Institute in, at Cambridge, which, which highlights uh, 
which projects forward uh, the credit ratings impact of, of climate um, uh, of climate change under under um, a couple of different scenarios. Uh, the main point being that um, uh, this uh, forecasting highlights that um, vulnerable countries are are likely to um, uh, to suffer from increased um, credit risks. Um, um, and uh, this in turn is having a flow on effect on how investors are responding to climate change. It's really highlighting the um, importance of this issue in, in the sovereign lending market. Um, so Zoe is going to discuss um, uh, in more detail um, some of the activities that are happening in, in that sector. Um, uh, in a moment, and I'll hand over to her shortly. Um, um, to, to sum up then, uh, you know, capital markets are starting to better understand how climate change risk is uh, impacting lending to governments. Um, and the reason this issue is important um, is that at present, um, a lot of these risks are not being accounted for uh, in bonds that are being issued today. Um, and this is a particular problem because sovereign debt is at record high levels at the moment, driven by years of, of low interest rates, uh, and more recently uh, from significant borrowing um, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the World Bank estimates that sovereign bond issues from low and middle income countries alone um, in 2020 were at record high of $457 billion. Um, and a lot of this debt was issued with long-term time horizons. Um, so if, if climate change hasn't been properly accounted for in the way that this debt was, was uh, raised, uh, it, it leads to the possibility of, of that some of those governments that have borrowed that money will default on those loans. Um, and default is, is significant. It's, it's bad basically for countries who suffer the reputational damage um, and higher costs of capital if they default. Um, some countries will get locked out of capital markets as a consequence of, of default. Um, in other words, investors will see them as too risky uh, and, and will stop lending the money. Um, and ultimately the publics of the countries themselves will, will suffer the costs, long-term costs, um, including from having less access to capital. Um, uh, investors also suffer in this scenario uh, when these risks aren't priced in um, and in the case of default because they're left with unpaid debts um, and they have to renegotiate those debt terms. Um, and so what we're highlighting in this slide is really a sort of return to history um, um, over the kind of history or over the course of, 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 um, of climate policy really. Um, um, and, and what we're setting out here is, is our observation of what, what seems to be this kind of um, uh, somewhat circuitous return. Um, so, um, you know, prior to the Paris Agreement in 2015, I think we were in a, uh, in a world where, which, you know, David Victor called global warming gridlock. Uh, which is really where states were relying on international treaty mechanisms and government action as the main mechanism to drive down emissions. Uh, and during this period, you know, the focus was very much on public stewardship, on government-based action to reduce risks in the economy, um, primarily by pricing in carbon externalities through taxes and, and emissions trading schemes, for example. Um, and then after 2015, the Paris Agreement ushered in a, a more bottom-up process, and importantly, um, you know, it brought together, I think, a lot of non-state activity. Um, uh, and key amongst this group was the investment community, some of whom decided to price in climate risks into their investment decisions through a whole suite of um, uh, coordinated actions. Um, uh, as, as really as an alternative way to try and capture those externalities in, in, um, uh, in the face of a lack of, of, of government action. Um, and while this is obviously still continuing in earnest, um, investors are now starting to realize that um, to fully price in climate risks again, risk again really requires, really does require governments, particularly in those 
sectors that aren't as exposed to uh, the capital markets. Uh, and so, you know, our observation is that we're, we're sort of entering into this phase where sovereign um, engagement uh, is much more important. And, and it's really in this context um, that, that um, yeah, that this issue comes to the fore and it's important to think about, you know, how investors um, might engage with governments um, to, to address climate risk uh, and what the scope and ability of investors to do that um, is. So with that, I'll hand over to Zoe, who will, uh, will explain a little bit about um, what's currently going on and, and our proposal, I guess, for, for an alternative way of, of, of going forward. Thanks, Arj. Um, much appreciated. So um, as Arj said, you know, I'm going to talk through a bit of this conversation about uh, how we see capital markets presently interacting with sovereigns on this issue. Um, and it is good, you know, I, I'll talk through uh, what we've seen happen to date, how investors might choose to interact with sovereign entities uh, going forward and what type of information they might ask for them how that's different to the way they interact with other entities they invest in and that's quite distinctly different and what that means for the approach they might take but i do think it is in that context it's really important to keep our eyes on this um what art is just calling a return to history because it's a really important part of it, it's a weird part of the conversation and it's an important part of the conversation it's weird because we find ourselves in capital markets saying to governments governments thou shalt manage climate change risk um, when in fact the government has always been the sort of uh, for a long time being considered the central owner of of the process so it is as Arj noted a little bit circular and sometimes when you're thinking through this you get to the point where you sort of say but isn't that what the government should do anyway and often the answer is actually yes um, so that's that's what I'm going to walk through and I should say that um, you know, as Arj highlighted earlier, we come at this conversation from a place where we spend a lot of time working with capital markets on these issues. So uh, we, we spend a lot of time sitting inside asset managers and asset owners, helping them think about how they might countenance these types of issues and how they might start to approach these risks. And so that's what sort of one of the angles that we're coming at this conversation from. So Arj, I might, we might go to the first slide here. Um, the point to take away from this slide is that engaging with sovereigns on climate risk is really something that investors are just starting to do. This is the classic TCFD uptake diagram. And for those of you who might not be familiar with it, I apologize if you are deeply familiar with it. Um, the, the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures is a disclosure framework which applies to corporates um, and also to investors, but generally to private entities, and which is basically a, a system of disclosure which is designed to do two things. Firstly, to and, and most openly, to force uh, uh, information into private and public markets such that those markets can make the appropriate decisions, uh, see climate risk and make appropriate decisions about it and price climate risk. Um, but secondly, as a really important but often less highlighted function, make entities that face into capital markets manage climate risk because you have to manage climate risk in order to do your TCFD disclosures. So it's sort of a, um, it's a behaviour standard hiding in a disclosure standard. So that's the TCFD. And this is the TCFD uptake um, curve, which was proposed in the, in the first recommendations of the TCFD. Um, it basically, what this base graph says is that there's the expectation that more and more entities that report into capital markets will report against the TCFD and behave in the ways that are prescribed by the TCFD over time. Um, and we are sort of somewhere part through halfway through this process at the moment. Now, the thing that I really wanted to highlight on this particular chart is that when investors started thinking about asking all of the entities they invested in about their climate risk exposures and about their climate risk management approaches, they started in the easy places. So they started particularly with public listed equities. So the, the, the stocks of companies that are listed in public markets, because the relationships were such, the information was such 
that that was a really sensible place for them to get going on this conversation. Now, over time, they have moved, they started to move their action through different asset classes. So they've started to think about uh, the debt investments that they have. They've started to think about the investments they have in private equity, the investments they have in real assets like property and infrastructure. And so in the last couple of years, those uh, property infrastructure uh, private equity, alternative things like hedge funds have started to be in, be areas where TCFD is starting to be integrated and climate risk is starting to be managed by capital markets. But uh, treasuries are the new frontier. So we speak to a lot of um, investment managers and asset owners who are working their way through this curve, basically, and they're starting to get to the treasuries side of things. There are a lot of other things coming in capital markets, but treasuries are one of the big frontiers. We might grab the next slide, Art. So what this means is that we are, it's very early days, but we are starting to see investors uh, acting on climate risk among sovereigns. So it's, it's really, you know, as I said, uh, a lot of people are still just trying to process what the best practice in this space should be. So it's very early days. But we are starting to see a bit of movement. So um, Swedish, the Swedish Central Bank famously uh, dumped bonds both from Alberta and also from Western Australia I think it was last year on the basis that they had too much climate risk exposure um, and uh, it caused a bit of a furore at the time the Western Australian government has just uh, published an ESG update for its investors in response to that so it's putting it's sort of sufficiently spooked them that they feel a need to respond there um, but we're starting to see conversations, more and more conversations about the uh, potential for exclusions on this basis. Our, our own RBA uh, have highlighted that they are having more and more conversations with their investors um, regarding climate risk and that there is the potential for a country like Australia to have its treasuries excluded from um, from certain investment universes or by certain investors on the basis of climate risk. And we'll talk a little bit about what they're actually engaging with in a moment. But one of the things to highlight uh, on this, when we, when we talk about this at this level, is that there actually hasn't been a huge amount of disclosure. So I just highlighted that Western Australia has sort of started making disclosures on this basis. But there hasn't been a huge amount of disclosure about climate risk across, across the sovereign universe. So um, the chart on the right is actually one that was put together by Arj in a paper that he wrote uh, earlier this year, which looks at the uh, climate risk disclosures of different uh, sovereigns against the likely economic impacts or the forecast economic impacts on those sovereigns under high climate change scenarios. So um, the takeaway from all of this is that even among the highly exposed sovereigns, there really aren't, there isn't that much in the way of disclosure yet. And so that's the flip side of that interest question. You know, we're just starting to see interest to in this topic among investors, and we are just starting to see disclosure as well. Arj, I might jump to the next slide. So when we, when we think about how investors might engage with this, because they're obviously just getting started, there is a question about what type of uh, information or what type of, not even type of information, we'll get to that in a moment, but what type of issues they might look for. And we would split these into two categories. The first of these is underlying risk. Um, so this includes both physical and transition risk, but this is an assessment of, let's say, a country or a state's exposure uh, to transition risk economically. So that's often about the, the sectors that are present in a country and their dominance in both um, domestic economies and also export economies, um, but also physical risk. So what is the extent of the country, the country's exposure to physical risk? Um, this is all the stuff we normally talk about with respect to how much population do you have near sea level? Uh, what, is your, what are your agricultural systems like? overlaid with what is the actual climate risk that we expect that you will experience. So that's the, the risk side. And we could talk about the risks. We can talk about all of this forever because there's so much in it. But the other side is about the climate management approach that the country has or the state has. Um, and we've divided this up into four categories here. Now, we don't mean to expect, as Arch highlighted in the, in the, in the outset, we don't mean to suggest that this is uh, this is a, a sort of a clear view on a hill. This is the the start of our thinking on this topic. So we're really looking forward to hearing people's views. 
but um, we've divided the responses that our nation might have into four categories here. And these include mitigation policies. Um, so obviously a, a massive area of focus at the moment, um, particularly for us or not. Um, transition policies, which is policies you might consider would be needed to transition a national economy such that it doesn't get unduly affected or stranded or parts of it get stranded by the, by the, the movement to net zero. Um, resilience and adaptation policies. So these are uh, national adaptation plans, these sorts of things that allow a country to address and mitigate major sources of physical climate risk. And then what we've, what we've called implementation, which is the processes that one might need to drive implementation of these uh, considerations across not only the bodies of the government, so including state-owned enterprises, but also using bodies of the government like regulators to drive these, uh, drive these priorities in private markets. So there's quite a lot that a government can actually do that an investor might look for to say, do I think this government is managing this risk um, and this issue appropriately? Now we'll get to that in the conclusions because it's quite important that it's it's a key part of why the approach that an investor might take with a government might be different from the approach an investor might take with a company, but we'll get to that. Arj, on the next slide, um, one of the questions we increasingly get asked is what type of information an investor could use to think about these considerations uh, in a government or in a state. Now, we've put quite a lot of things on this page and one of the things that is happening in the space is uh, Arj highlighted earlier that some of the research houses are starting to pick this up. And so we are seeing a, a, a growing production of both risk indices that sort of try and take all the different aspects of underlying risk and put them together um, into some type of index. ND gain is one that a lot of people use, a lot of investors are paying attention to, um, and that obviously has a number of components to it. But there's also increased efforts to produce a lot of um, private risk indices, which you um, might not see outside of a paywall, but will start to see in the economics research that a lot of different um, financial institutions produce. Now, some of the metrics that feed into that on the physical risk side, um, there's obviously a lot of different assessments of physical risk. Um, I, you guys know more about that than, than I do, certainly, so I'm actually not going to going to enumerate them except to say that there's quite a depth of information there and the main issue tends to be filtering it and um, let's say compressing it for use in financial markets because financial markets often don't have the time to process that information or the expertise needed to process information at the depth that we might like them to. Um, on industrial risk there's a lot of considerations with respect to the sectoral exposure that a country has. Um, and the emissions intensity of industry and key activities such as transport. Now, there are a lot of indexes that have evolved around that, um, including some that have been produced for the SDGs. Uh, but those are the considerations that tend to come up again and again. And then on adaptation, there are, of course, measures of vulnerability and response capacity um, that appear in, in quite a few of these assessments. Now, on the policy side, there's a whole stack of indicators. Some of them actually repeat some of the risk indicators. So you'll see in the transition category, there are a number of indicators there that really do overlap with risk, which are about sectoral exposure, the change in sectoral exposure over time. Um, industrial po um, policy and the sort of extent of that shift. And then also, you know, everyone likes to focus on fossil fuel subsidies for good reason, because they're a good indicator of where the government's head is at. Um, but there's a, there's a range of additional items which start to roll into the response side, basically, including things like insurance coverage or things as specific as insurance coverage and things as broad as what is the national uh, mitigation policy and what are the NDCs. So what I would note about all of this is that there's not a fixed, if you, if you speak to this about companies, and we speak to this about companies all the time, there's starting to be a rather, I wouldn't say fixed, but a very focused set of information that people know that they want for different sectors and you might have been some of you might have been conscious of or involved in this conversation about metrics which is happening in financial markets that is an effort to try and get to a list of metrics which are most relevant um, so that's more developed um, with companies but certainly with states there's quite a range of metrics that might be used in these types of assessments Arj I'm going to move to the next slide and note the time 
So one of the things to highlight, and I'm going to touch on this gently here and then get to it in the conclusion, is that the, the response categories for corporates and countries are very different. Now, this might seem like an insane point to make um, because you might be thinking, of course, they're very different. Like it's a country or a state. It's a company. They're completely different entities. Why are we even having this conversation? It's obvious. The reason we're having this conversation is because we are doing that. I um, can't remember what you call it, Arj, that, you know, um, reverse history or, or that return to history process, which is we're now treating sovereign climate risk using capital markets. And that's why we're even having a conversation about the fact that companies and, ca and um, countries are different. And the way that they're different is particularly with respect to the, the size of, of the response capacity that a country has. A country or a state are operating at a systems level, whereas a company is often a piece of a system able to influence and act along its value chain, but in some ways very, very constrained. And so the categories of response that we ask for from a country are very, very different from the categories categories of response we traditionally ask for from a corporate. Now, I'm going to hit this point in the conclusion, so I'm going to keep moving because I know we want some time for Q&A. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that jump out here. So um, one of the things, as Arj highlighted at the beginning, that people tend to do when they start thinking about climate risk in investments is they think about engagement and they think about um, divestment. And there's this huge debate, as many of you will know, regarding which one of those pathways one might take. Now, um, for a number of reasons, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, and, and also for, for reasons that have to do with this conversation in capital markets more broadly, there's been a big focus on engagement. And I can say from the broader capital markets perspective, that's really come from a place where people have realised that, except for a few key entities, a sort of narrow set of entities, there really is a need to get most entities in the system to move rather than uh, constraining their access to capital. So there's a big focus on engagement in capital markets generally at the moment across all asset classes. And I think that will feed into sovereigns. Now, this is only just starting. You know, we're starting to hear blips about it around the place, but the level of engagement that we see in capital markets on companies is extraordinary. It's very organized and it's very extensive. Uh, and successful, but we're really not, we're only just starting to see engagement um, on sovereigns. Uh, Joe might move to the next slide because there's a couple of reasons why engagement with sovereigns is very, very different from engagement with companies. And this is sort of one of the key points that we want to make coming out of this, out of this, um, this piece of thinking. Um, the first is just that there is a very different practical relationship between an investor in, in a sovereign and an investor in a company, um, which changes the context entirely. So a few, a few notable differences here, um, incentives, recourse, and the actual exposure. Quickly on incentives, the economic incentives for engagement with sovereigns are quite quite different from the economic incentives for engagement with companies, particularly with when you're investing in equity. So obviously the, the, the financial structure is different. You're in debt, you've got different exposures, and also the timelines are quite different. Um, on exposure, which is uh, another, another, the other point I want to touch on very quickly, there is less exposure because of the vagaries of, 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 of um, you know, national financial governance, access, um, economic fortunes, there is less exposure uh, among high risk, highly vulnerable company countries. I keep saying countries and companies and going back and forward. There is less exposure among highly vulnerable countries to private sector financing um, than among less vulnerable countries. Um, and as a consequence, the interaction between the two and the use of capital markets to manage climate risk in those settings might be more constrained. The most important one I actually wanted to highlight here is recourse. So this is the one in the middle. And this is that the, you know, if you are a um, if you are a private, if you're an investor in a in a in a company uh, in their debt and they go bankrupt or or even just don't pay you back, you have a lot of recourse. Whereas when this happens with a country, you really don't. It's a very, very different relationship. And so the, the grounds on which you have to say, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to get you in trouble if, you, if your payments aren't what you said they would be, um, are very, very different 
And indeed, I would add to this actually that the role that a treasury plays in an investor's investment portfolio is quite different from the role that a probably more discretionary investment in another asset class might play in the same portfolio. And so on the investor side, there is less discretion to exclude um, and divest in treasuries, one would say. Now, that's not the case for all countries, but it's certainly the case for some. Now, the other point of difference to go to the next slide is an ethical difference. And this is, there are two points here. The first is that, as Arj noted earlier, there is a reinforcing vulnerability that exists in the relationship between a, a sovereign and its capital provider, which is to say that if, um, you know, a country is facing significant physical climate risk and the capital provider says, well, you know, I'm, I'm not as comfortable lending to you, so I'm going to increase your cost of capital, that capital provider is constraining the ability of the country in question to respond to the risk. Um, and that relationship could become reinforcing. Now, that's not unique to countries, um, but we probably care about it a lot more with countries than we do when it's the, when it's the case with companies, um, particularly because in many cases, the countries we're talking about aren't actually responsible for the risks that they face um, or don't have control over the risks that they face. So there is this question of reinforcing vulnerability, which is quite important um, ethically when we're thinking about engaging as private investors with, with a sovereign. The other point is just the right to self-determination. So um, when you're an investor and you're engaging with a company, you have a claim on the company, an ownership claim on the company. And really, people aren't particularly uncomfortable. Some people are uncomfortable, but people aren't particularly uncomfortable with your ability to or the, with your assertion that you should have um, some say in what the company does. That's not the case with countries, um, particularly not, uh, well, I'd say normatively, probably particularly not in democratic contexts. But even just generally, we don't like to think that private entities and capital markets should be able to influence the decisions that a country might make. So this really changes the context of the interaction between the investor and the country versus um, the place that a lot of investors are coming from, which is interacting with entities that they own or have an ownership claim to. And these two points together, you know, the different context and the different ethics means that the um, environment that investors are engaging in when it comes to sovereigns is notably different. And this brings us to our conclusions. So I promise I've only got two slides here. Um, the first of these is that as an overarching point, investors, there is a conversation at the moment about taking the TCFD, which is the disclosure framework we spoke about earlier, and moving it entirely into the sovereign context and just saying, give me T TCFD disclosures on your, on your bonds. Um, now, the argument we would make is that that's not entirely appropriate, and that is because you're in a completely different context. So in a, in, a, in a private, in a company context, you have an ownership claim. Um, you have the company itself has a limited context, which constrains a limited uh, context for response, which constrains its uh, the sort of management activities that you might take as a company. Uh, you have a high commercial exposure to the company in many respects. Um, and the company does hope does face reinforcing risk and reinforcing vulnerability, but you probably don't care about it quite as much. Whereas on the sovereign side, you, you need self-determination. The sovereign itself has system-wide control. The commercial exposures are different, often lesser, and the country often the countries often face reinforcing risk, and you care about that. You know, you don't want to be in there destabilizing states. Um, with your investment activity, it probably doesn't look good. You're allowed to do it with companies. You're probably not allowed to do it with states. And so this leads us to probably our, our central conclusion in all of this, which is that an investor needs to have a differentiated engagement response between advanced economies and emerging economies or vulnerable economies. Um, Arj, I might jump to the next slide on this. And what we would suggest is that in the advanced economy context, the, the focus of investor engagement should be accountability for transition, because this is something that um, has been, has been a, a real area of angst for investors to date. Um, it is something that countries have a lot of control over. And it is also probably the piece that will form a, will form significant or provide significant differentiation between different countries 
right? A lot of countries face a lot of physical risk. Um, a lot of them can't actually do anything about the geography, but many of them can do a lot about their, um, their transition and their transition pathways and transition policies. So in the advanced economy um, context, that is the, the focus we would suggest. And in the emerging economy uh, context, we would suggest really the focus should be on reducing vulnerability. So there are a number of, um, a number of what should I say, approaches, strategies that can be introduced that can uh, basically support emerging economies to uh, step away from that or, or get some distance from that reinforcing vulnerability we just spoke about. It includes things like sustainability linked debt um, and encourage transition and encourage adaptation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close here because um, I've, we've just talked at you for quite a long time, but um, nonetheless, this is probably the emphasis of the thinking at the moment is that there really needs to be this quite clear differentiation between the way that an investor engages with a sovereign um, when an investor starts to encounter and think about and countenance um, climate risk in, in the sovereign context. Um, I might pass it back to the floor, so to speak. Uh, Peter, you're still on mute there. I was thinking I wasn't. Can you hear me now? We can. Much better. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's a great kind of um, very clear exposition of the different um, aspects, the different problems, or the the, the, uh, the considerations that one faces with uh, with sovereign investment versus corporate investment, and how that might relate to climate. Because my Q and A isn't working, I'm going to start with asking my own question first, which is cheating. Which is, is there kind of a an a rising movement in the kind of ethical investment um, pool that is obviously somewhat active in the in the corporate space around this area. Is this an area where there's now careful consideration when thinking about uh, um, sovereigns as well, or is this just regarded as too hard yet? It's still a little bit. It's still a little bit in the too hard basket. Some of the leading, there, there are two types of investors who are starting to countenance this with sort of real, um, real focus. Um, the first are large investors who have made commitments under the recent um, industry frameworks to um, set targets up and set engagement mechanisms up and have managed to go through their other asset classes and have now got to to treasuries and gone, gosh, I've got to do something here. Mm. Um, they're really just getting started. We work with a few of them. Um, the other group of people who have been more and more engaged with this have probably been, as you know, investors who are more ethically inclined, and they do tend to lead, lead the pack on some of these issues. And you can see that both in some of the very focused ethical managers, um, but also in some of the parts of the world where they've done a lot of the other heavy lifting on climate change, for example, in Scandinavia. And so they're starting to sort of move into this space and think both about what their um, what their impact pathway should be in their investment decisions, uh, and also what their risk exposure is. But it, you know, as we noted, it's it's um, ethically a little bit more complicated. Great, thank you. And at this point, I'll pass back to Angela, who'll take us through some of the questions in Q and A, where I note there's a there's a decent selection. Thanks, Peter. There certainly is. I'm going to start with a question from Fraser Gibson. So, Fraser, if you'd like to, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question yourself. We'll then go to a couple of the questions from John Neve. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, what have I unmuted myself? I have, uh, I think. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. My question uh, uh, was about the, the interaction between the sovereign debt and private debt and the ability to have insurance um, and where, you know, if you can't insure it, you're going to have trouble getting debt to finance it. <laughs> so, and, and of course, insurance, as I understand it, at big levels or high levels is only a feature of Western countries or de semi-developed countries. You know, there's not much insurance uh, of uh, prime assets or, or cities or anything else in like Indonesia or South America or stuff. So uh, would you perhaps comment on that, please? Do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I, I can start and then Zoe, um, feel free to add um, to that. So I guess um, 
First, thank you for the question, because I think it's a really important issue and one we didn't have time to cover. Um, um, but, uh, but on the first part of your question, you know, about the relationship, I guess, between private debt and sovereign debt, um, what, one of the, I guess, more nefarious aspects of climate, um, of, of, you know, of, I guess, this, um, of assessing sovereign climate risk is that, um, the credit ratings, the credit rating of a sovereign um, has flow on effects for firms in a country. So if a, a country has, um, you know, its credit ratings downgraded, that has flow on effects for how the corporations within that country um, uh, can also access the capital markets. And so there is this kind of yeah, feedback loop, um, so to speak, on, on that front. Um, but to your question about insurance, um, the um, yeah you know there this is obviously a very a big problem um, the uh, particularly in in developing countries as you point out um, where insurance rates tend to be a, a lot lower um, uh, there are some um, you know important um, bilateral efforts um, uh, to risk share amongst countries. Um, uh, and particularly uh, with respect to disaster risk resilience. So in the Pacific, for instance, there's a, there's a, um, a risk sharing arrangement between several countries. Um, um, but clearly, you know, more, more needs to be done in, in that space. And um, I'll just give a plug, if you're interested in that issue, a colleague of ours, um, Jeff Summerhays, uh, who may be known to some of you as the former um, uh, commissioner at, at uh, the Prudential Regulator, APRA, um, recently wrote a really good paper on this uh, with Cambridge University on, on risk sharing um, and some of the mechanisms available there. So point, point you towards that uh, resource if you want to learn more. I would only add to that that from experience in, in um, private markets or, 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 you know, not private markets, but with experience from experience in private entities, the point that insurances are reinforcing and, and often um, enabling source of risk is, is very clearly playing out in private markets or in, among private entities. So it's quite often the case that it's actually the insurance that goes first before the debt. And the big concern, um, certainly with the banks and the housing market here is not that the banks will sort of up and just do their climate vulnerability assessment up and overnight decide that they don't want to finance mortgages in a certain region, but instead that insurance will be pulled back, insurance availability will pull back in certain regions. And that's what will set off the lack of access to finance. So it is you know, that, that, that interaction is very real to the extent that insurance is often the leading risk rather than the lagging risk. Um, and to Arj's point and to the discussion more broadly, the ability to, um, and this is certainly something that comes up in Jeff's paper, the ability to um, find ways to extend insurance in contexts where um, either traditionally it would have been withheld or it doesn't presently exist will be a really, really important part of how the financial system deals with and manages climate vulnerability, particularly as we move into the period where it's not transition risk we're dealing with so much as physical risk. It's going to become really, really important to stand up new risk sharing um, instruments. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So we'll go next to John Neath, and then after that, I'll go to Barbara. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is there still any valid business reason uh, to uh, not adopt a rapid transition to renewables? No. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, you know, we get into the debate around reliability over and over and over and over again. Um, the best arguments we've seen about that are that we have a lot of a lot of solutions for reliability that will come online in the time that we need them, and uh, that if you've got real concerns about reliability, you can overbuild. There's no shortage. You know, we we speak to asset owners a lot, and um, one of the things that we hear from them over and over again is that they uh, they miss the boat on renewables because there's so much money that wants to go into renewables now. It's all very cheap 
So there's so certain... it makes it makes it makes very smart business sense to uh, you know to adopt adopt the adopt it rapidly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's not a very in depth answer, but then it's also quite a straightforward one, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Thank you. We'll go across now to Barbara's question. Barbara, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to. Uh, yes, my, my apologies. Look, I, oh, sorry, it's my grandparents' clock in the background there. Um, uh, uh, there are, I've got two questions. One sort of, they're both at different ends of the spectrum, I suppose, inverted commas. So I'll ask the second one. Um, it seems that at um, uh, one level, there seems to be um, a um, in terms of at the national level, there seems to be some difficulty with um, uh, uh, our government engaging with risk in terms of defence or, or national security. And I'm wondering how this, um, I've just read a little bit about it, I'm no expert, but I do wonder how this will play out, particularly over the next few years um, that are so critical in terms of mitigation. Um, I work in a lot of adaptation stuff, so it's different, but um, although there is some crossover, of course, but I'm, I'm not quite sure there's any clear thinking around, uh, in, in the insurance sector, absolutely, but there's not much clear thinking around um, um, what national uh, risk in terms of security looks like when we think about climate change and failure to mitigate. Um, those risks. Sure. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you, Barbara. I mean, I think this is it's a really interesting question, and it's 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 very. Um, uh, I was thinking as you were asking it uh, that um, you you must be a mind reader because um, this project and our thinking around this really came out of a, a piece of work that we're doing. Um, um, for on exactly this question um, with uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, so ah. uh, there's going to be a publication on, on exactly this topic, which is coming out um, in, in uh, before the end of the year. Um, but to, uh, you know, I guess um, to answer the question a bit more directly, the um, uh, interestingly enough, the, you know, the Department of Defense and the defense apparatus um, in, in this country at least has, um, and, and I think that's, this is true of, of other countries as well, um, by virtue of not politicizing climate change has have been uh, fairly forward looking in, in respect of risk um, uh, and some of the national security risks. Um, and so there is, um, you know, quite an in-depth process, I think, uh, within those parts of the government to think about the way that climate change might affect um, you know, um, uh, movement of people in, in the region um, uh, might, might increase uh, geopolitical risks, uh, might give rise to, um, you know, conflict over natural resources and, and water in particular. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, cer certainly, uh, you know, I think from the investment perspective, uh, um, I think there is actually quite a lot to learn from from the way that um, the national security community has kind of thought about uh, thought about risk in this area. All right, so that is just about time. Although we do have a couple more questions in the chat, um, Arjun, are we happy to go another couple of minutes, or would you prefer to wrap up there? Yep. All right. In that case, um, I'll go to Nilmini, and I'm, I apologise if I've mispronounced that, and I'll get you to ask your question if you'd like to. Yep. Hi, Arj. So a quick question. You've talked about this a bit in terms of reinforcing vulnerability. Do you have a sense of how sufficient finance might be mobilised to fill the adaptation financing deficit? Because... It's certainly it's already a huge issue, and as investor awareness of climate-related risk, particularly in vulnerable nations, grows, it's likely that that finance will become even harder to access. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got two thoughts on this, and I'll pass to you because um, I know you have thoughts as well. The 
one of the really interesting things about the conversation coming out of COP, particularly when it comes to adaptation financing, is that there is still, I think, sometimes an intentional um, misunderstanding between private the private market and a lot of public sector actors regarding where capital is going to come from. And I say that because um, I don't think that was the case in the past, but, you know, you hear these commitments coming out of COP um, from GFANS, which is the big um, investor collaboration that made the big commitment early on at COP26 this year. Um, and you hear these sort of massive numbers about, you know, we've got hundreds of trillions of dollars that are going to be dedicated, that are going to be net zero aligned. And a lot of, a lot of you know, investors are committing finance that's going to help not just with transition, but also with adaptation. But there really is very, you know, investors, investors face very strong constraints with respect to the way that they use their money. So they're not allowed to use their money in ways that, that don't give them certain types of return and that don't give them certain types of diversification. Most large investors are very heavily governed with respect to the way they can actually utilise and deploy capital. And those constraints have been sufficiently tight that they even struggle to invest in transition. And it's happening, you know, they're missing opportunities. They are struggling to chase this trend down because they're so tightly governed with respect to how they can allocate money and, and the rules that they, the things they can and can't invest in. And that means that the types of, um, there are some types of adaptation finance that they'll find quite straightforward to participate in. And those are the types of adaptation finance that apply to specific assets you know, when, when it is the case that, a, that an investor owns a particular toll road or a port or something along these lines, that's the sort of thing they can engage with. But when it's the case that the adaptation finance needs to happen at a system level or a community level, they are really, really going to struggle to be able to dedicate the capital needed to, to, to contribute to any of that. And so when you hear these huge, uh, you know, statements about the private sector and how much capital it's going to contribute, that capital is not it is really going to struggle to add to, to service the the adaptation financing gap in a, in a really like you know I I I I um I struggle to express how um what's the word inimical this is to the investment context that a lot of large investors find themselves in. So that's that's what on one side that's a you know they're going to struggle. The flip side of it is that we've just sort of outlined that investors should be very careful with how they engage with sovereigns. But that doesn't mean that they will be careful because if, if the last um, decade has taught, I think, us anything about financial markets, it's that um, activists in financial markets and also investors who are concerned about climate risk okay. will basically use whatever tools they have open to them to make a response happen. And I think what that means is that a lot of countries, even though they potentially shouldn't, will face very significant pressure from capital markets regarding both their transition policies and the mitigation policies, their transition programs and their adaptation programs. And so although I don't think capital markets, private entities are likely to actually be the source of that financing, they might be a very strong source of the pressure that might drive public financing to start to close that gap, particularly if we start to get sustainability linked financing from that, from that space. But Arj, you'll have something to say here too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Zoe. And, and um, thanks, Neil Mooney. It's nice to um, hear from you again. Um, uh, you know, I think that the um, it's, it's, it's a really important question. And let me try and be, uh, let me present a slightly uh, different and positive uh, story, uh, which is, um, you know, this year, and I'm, I'm sorry to kind of stick to this theme of cross-referencing other material, but um, I think it's relevant in this case. Um, uh, this year's UNEP adaptation gap report, um, it's an annual report put out by the UN, um, you know, looks at the kind of financing gap amongst other things. Um, and this year we focused on, um, you know, the relationship between COVID-19 and adaptation. And um, among the things that we looked at as part of that report was thinking about some of the parallels. Um, and so to Zoe's point about, um, you know, the opportunities for public and private financing, um, what, one of the things that we highlighted was the massive amounts of capital that were mobilized in response to the pandemic. Um, uh, and we thought through a little bit how that might play out with respect to adaptation um, and how governments sort of think about 
adaptation and the climate crisis in, in similar terms. Now, that won't obviously go anywhere near filling the entire adaptation gap, but, um, uh, but I guess it's important uh, to kind of have this conversation and for at least for public investors or public financiers uh, to raise that level of ambition given the um, severity of the risks. Um, but um, and conscious of the time, I won't go into detail here, but also the report also thought through some of the financing mechanisms which might help attract private financing and overcome some of those issues that Zoe was talking about. Interesting. Thank you, Arj, Zoe. All right, in the interest of time, I'll hand back to Peter to wrap up. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Angela. And thanks particularly to, to Zoe and Arj. As I said, that's a, it's, it's an area I'd not thought much about and the, the subtleties and the distinctions that, we're going to, that are going to play out here, thinking about the uh, the private versus public or sovereign capital markets is going to be really interesting. It sounds like there's a range of problems, but also a range of possibilities. Where, like most of this, this whole complicated space, there might be a way through, uh, but we'll have to think about it carefully and perhaps a little differently than we're used to. Um, so thanks again, everyone else, for turning up and for the questions. Um, it's, it's, it's great to see kind of interest in as we survey the whole extraordinary breadth of the problem and the approaches to, to the transition. Um, keep in touch with the website for upcoming seminars. We're not quite sure what's actually happening in the next little while. We've got a, a few things under, under discussion. Uh, things will go quiet as we get close to Christmas, um, but uh, the website will, uh, will obviously detail things as we do them. Um, and so thanks, uh, thanks to everyone again, and thanks particularly to the speakers.